Hey team, we just have an amazing podcast for you here today because Minter Dial is back on the show. Minter, you'll recall, is professional speaker, elevator, and multiple award-winning author. And his core career stint was 16 years spent as a top executive at L'Oreal, where he was a member of their worldwide executive committee for the professional products division. He's the author of the World War II biography and documentary film, The Last Ring Home, and three award-winning business books, Future Proof, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And we talked to Minter about that book the last time he was on our podcast. And then both those first two books won Best Business Book Awards. And Artificial Empathy, the second edition, has been released. And and but that's the one we're going to be talking to Minter about today, Artificial Empathy putting heart into business and artificial intelligence. Minter has a weekly podcast called Minter Dialogue. He's also currently working on a new book being published serially online, meaning one chapter a week for literally 70 weeks, Dialogos, Fostering More Meaningful Conversations. He's publishing it online via something called Substack, and you can actually check that out in the show notes for today. But the topic and the real focus today, we know that the best professional salespeople, you know, are management consultants who really help their clients and prospects achieve a better business outcome, better future. And they can only do do that by understanding the world and the situation of that buyer. And that part of that is empathy. And today we're going to be talking about the definition of empathy. We'll, We'll try and figure out, you know, can it be learned or can it be taught? The answer to that is yes. Um, we're going to be talking about why it's so important internally with your business, you know, why it's so important externally. So both employee experience and external customer experience. And then we're going to be talking about, you know, some projects underway today where they're trying early days of understanding how to apply empathy into artificial intelligence. Really interesting stuff with Mentor. Um, One of the core messages for me today was that empathy can be learned. This is something that's an ongoing opportunity, I think, for me. And we can do that by listening actively, exploring the differences between, you know, different types of people, Um, reading fiction. You really want to hear what Mentor has to say about that, how it's helpful to read fiction, you know, to work on the muscle of empathy, exploring mindfulness, being mindful is always uh, helpful for empathy, and then knowing your why. There's a constant theme in life and in this topic. Uh, We'll talk about lots of different great things, including a pretty interesting experience that Minter had being part of a small group of people who went through the empathetic future experience where they interacted with a chatbot for five days. And you'll, you know, hearing his experience there where the chatbot was trying to be empathetic. Really cool stuff today, team. Um, I always enjoy my conversations with Mentor. I'm sure you will too. And when you do, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast because that really matters to us. And thank you for doing so. Here's Mentor Dial. Hey, Mentor, welcome to the show again. It's great to see you. Mr. Cox, great to have you in my my line of vision. (laughs) And and how's the pickleball? I've been noticing a lot of involvement with pickleball online with you. Well, pickle less, paddle more. Okay. My sport is paddle tennis, which is um, me. Thank you. It's all both of them are uh, greatly ascending sports in the United States. Paddle behind pickle for now, but I was just on the phone with the commissioner of the professional paddle league, and he says, "Watch out!" <laughs> wow. And what were you doing on the phone with the commissioner of the professional league? Are you a professional well, player? Well, well no, I, I, I'm i six years old, so that isn't possible anymore. I, of course, I play maybe in the veterans, but uh, no, I, I'm a, let's say, a deep, long-rooted aficionado paddle. I've been playing since 1974, spreading wow. the word about the sport that really came of age uh, in the last 10 years, helped in part by the pandemic and uh, a lot of well-known football soccer players who have come into inside. This is the sport of the future. How about that? Well, I'll tell you what, thank you. I'll do a deeper dive in that. I, I am I will, de- 
I'll send you a link to some hot dog points. It is so entertaining <laughs> to watch. And the beauty of paddle, because I've just started a podcast called the Joy of Paddle podcast, that the beauty of the sport is that it's a deeply social sport, easy to start, therefore easy for beginners to wail and hoot and have fun on a paddle court right from the get-go. Then as you get better, you've got to learn new tricks and trades, and it gets all sorts of sophisticated and nuanced. Anyway, that's my thing these days. Well, you... Yes, I will take a look into it. I was an avid tennis player. I played a lot of table tennis. So that was something we did a lot of growing up. And so love the racket sports. And by the way, Minter, one of the reasons I was so excited to chat with you, um, outside of the fact that I really, I really enjoyed Artificial Empathy, the book we're going to be talking about today. Of course, you've been on the show previously when we talked about your prior book, You Lead. But, but having these conversations, you strike me as over in North America here, we have a, we have a commercial about Dozeki's beer. And oh, yeah. there's this interview with the world's most interesting man. And, <laughs> and you always strike me when I read your books and we have these conversations, you strike me as a real Renaissance man, you know, the world's most interesting man. So I know our, our discussion today is going to go in lots of different areas, but hey, thanks so much for joining again. My great pleasure, and, and I'm gushing and embarrassed by the, the, the idea of the greatest renaissance man. Definitely <laughs> liked lots of topics, though, I can say that. So, so today's topic, artificial empathy, putting heart into business and artificial intelligence. So as we, we jump in and do a little deep dive, I do want to read a couple of the testimonials of this book. So, so um, right off the top, we hear in artificial empathy, Minter Dial masterfully makes the case for why empathy is not only learnable, but a requirement for success in business and life. And that came from Charlene Lee, a best-selling author and founder of Altimeter. Another one, empathy will be the key competitive advantage of the 21st century. Dial captures the full essence of that one special quality that makes us truly human. Neil Watson, AI and robotics uh, faculty at Singularity University. We talk about singularity a lot on this show. And then a third one, they're, they're, they're all over the book, but a third one I really jumped out at me. In, in a tech-driven society, empathy is an increasingly rare and valuable skill. That came from Dory Clark, or author of Entrepreneurial You and Stand Out. And so artificial empathy lays out this business case and a path for putting more heart and empathy into business and machines for a healthier and more profitable future. So, so given you know the diversity of some of the other books you've written, I think there's some tie, of course, into you lead. What really prompted you, Minter, to go down the path of this topic? And of course, we're on the second printing of the book. I think the first printing was 2018, if I'm not That's mistaken. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So there's the, let's say, nominal reason, which I, I will more often than not talk about, which is that my observation was having worked in business, working with lots of people, and this is pre-pandemic, that there was a, a constant failing in businesses with regard to the humanity of management. There was great mm. focus on productivity, efficiencies, effectiveness, and all that at the cost of the how, the how you speak to each other, how you listen. So that's the nominal reason. The actual reason, which is much more personal, was that uh, my best friend killed himself. And at that time, I was Sorry. writing another book, and I just, it became my therapy to figure out, because I accompanied him through the last six weeks, about empathy uh, and how it can be also extremely pertinent, practical, important in person, not just in work. I'm so sorry about your friend. And you said you accompanied him in the last six weeks. Um, well, on the phone, mostly, um, you know, we and, and obviously in person as well, at, in, interspersed, but that was it. Wow. What an experience that must have been. Yep. And, and, you know, hopefully from something like that, you know, when we, we read this book, some, some great good can come from it. it and so, um, you know, mentor in the book, and I, I think it's, I, I really enjoy your writing style. I find it so engaging and so, so interesting. And frankly, it's just so smart being, being someone mm -hmm. who's writing a book right now and having a you know pretty tough time of it. 
at some point in time in the first chapter, you say, you know, continue reading if, okay, if you think satisfying customers is important, or you think you want employees to be more engaged, or if you're contemplating or implementing an AI strategy, or you want to improve your innovation pipeline or design a new product website or office space, there are about five or six other things here. The, you know, anybody listening to this podcast should maybe turn up the volume because frankly, you, you identify at the beginning of this book, this ideal client profile for the book, which is virtually everybody in the universe. <laughs> so so I, I, I can't believe there's anybody in business technically today, small, medium or large enterprise who doesn't want to do some of these things. But, but let's stop, start with the core of this topic, empathy. And all of us hear about sympathy and we hear about emotional intelligence and we hear about compassion and all these different things. Let, let's define empathy. What is empathy? All right. So there's lots of misconceptions and certainly there's no one single definition because in the empathy activist world, there was lots of um, jiggling and, and realigning as to what, what, it, what empathy really might be. For mm -hmm. me, the way I define empathy is the ability to understand what someone else is thinking, feeling, or experiencing. And it breaks down into two styles of understanding. The first is cognitive, where I, I understand what your situation is, and I see where you are, and I hear what you're saying, and I, I, I observe your feelings. The second type is emotional or affective empathy, and that's when you feel what the other person's feeling. So you, you ab absolutely can feel the sadness that the other person, when they're feeling sad and such. And this is an important distinction because some people say there's only one form and it's all together. Others mm -hmm. say it must be attached to compassion. For me, compassion and other styles of outputs really are distinct from the, the notion of empathy, which is discreetly about your ability to understand. What you do with that understanding can be compassion can be sympathy, can be other things, but is, it should be detached. And that's really the important piece because in business, what I tend to preach and, and promote is thinking about how to improve your cognitive empathy. Mm. Trying to teach somebody to have emotional empathy, I don't know if that's really possible. And it certainly isn't possible for a machine. Uh, which we'll get to. So, so um I think it's it's kind of a good example of so kind of clarifying you just shared this an unfortunate person personal story of your pal, you know, automatically, I, I would default to this cognitive empathy, or almost sympathy where I, I, I don't know what that feels like. But I do have sadness or concern for you having gone through it. Is that cognitive empathy? Or is that sympathy? Well, if you feel sadness, that is uh, effective. Uh, okay. Empathy, where you're reflecting or mirroring my sadness, which is deep. And of course, it's now been uh, six years, I think. Um, but uh, I still, every time I talk about the book, it is an opportunity for me to think about Philippe. And, um, and I, I lo love the idea of, of giving pause to be mm -hmm. present in the moment, even with some past figure. I just been writing about a, an, an, I'm writing a new book about conversation, and one of the amazing conversations I had was with uh, a Native American Indian who has the presence to speak to her ancestor seven generations ago. So that's where my monkey brain just took me. But the idea wow. of being present with conversation, uh, you can do it with trees, you can do it with ancestors, and in this case, of my dead pal, who, to whom you dedicated the book. Yes, and and actually the second edition I also dedicated to a lovely fellow empathy activist who unfortunately died of cancer, Jackie Acho. She was just a, a light in my life. And uh, unfortunately, she expired too early. So, so circling back now to empathy, we've defined it. And then you, you did talk about, hey, I think maybe we can develop and learn cognitive empathy. empathy. I, I'm not sure that we can do the same for emotional empathy. And, and when you were talking about, you know, can it be learned in the book? I, uh, being a sales trainer and a consultant, I, I'm, I immediately 
kind of aligned with this thought where you can't teach anybody anything if they don't want to learn it, right? There's nothing worse than running a sales workshop where, you know, there's um, 10% of the class just doesn't want to be there. We always try, try and make them optional when clients engage our services because we just don't want that person in the room. So, so um, how do we learn it? Well, like you say, you need to want to learn it. And once you have that appetite, um, then there are various ways you can improve your empathy. Obviously, the key point is what willingness, curiosity to learn about the other person. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that, in other words, you might be looking from above, poo-pooing certain status of people, then it becomes difficult to be believable uh, in terms of the empathy from the receiver. I have a, uh, an example of just talking to strangers, uh, complete strangers, not someone mm. you have a common link with, but a cashier, a bus driver, and talk to them. We're not looking for you to have a, a sort of a deep philosophical conversation because generally they don't have the time either, but try to observe and, and completely understand what the other person's saying. Stay with them. Don't just bring it back to you. Stay with them and, and keep prying into their lives, obviously not in a way to exploit their privacy, but this idea. Or a second great way is to read great fiction. And the important part of this is great fiction. And what I mean by that is well-written dialogues, well, well-developed characters, such that if you are a man, you could read Madame Bouvary by Flaubert or whatever, uh, uh, so you can learn about the psyche and the things that happen, the thoughts in a woman's mind. Obviously, there's a, a little bit of a generational gap there, but in general, the idea is reading good fiction. And... And the last piece is really just to uh, make sure you make the time. And and this is perhaps the more more practical element is when you want to have empathy, you need to have time. And it must be a time when you are able to evacuate all your other Mm. concerns and worries and be fully present with the other. If 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 you don't do that, then you need to start with the basics, which is who are you and and who do you want to be and help mm. you to understand why this is important to you. If you don't have a why underneath it, it becomes like a, oh, I really want to learn another language. What language? Um, Italian. Why? Well, because it sounds nice. Not enough. You need to have a stronger root. Well, you know, my grandfather spoke to me in Italian and I never knew how to understand him. That's why I want to speak Italian. Okay. That sounds a little bit more plausible. Same goes with this idea of learning to be more empathic. If you can attach it to a reason, in other words, the type of person you want to be maybe in your legacy or the type of manager you want to be in your company, then that will help you to sort of find the time, the energy to read, talk to strangers, give the time to your companions and so on. Well, you mentioned, by the way, the, the reason I asked the question, I thought the reading fiction really jumped out at me when I was reading the book. Hey, that's a way. Of, of developing empathy. And, and it was part of these five items you listed is how do I build that muscle? And you covered a couple of them, listening actively, exploring differences, uh, reading fiction, particularly classic fiction, doing mindfulness and knowing and going to the why. And so many roads end up leading to this why, you know, in life and in business really these days. But, but you, do, you do come back a number of times in the book, Minter, and say it's so important for business. And so we're going to have lots of CEOs listening to this podcast, mostly of mid-sized enterprises, or we have sales leaders of large enterprise. So they're running big teams. And, and so why is you know, empathy such an important thing? to make sure is front of mind for management at the executive team and and really a driving force in terms of how we run our businesses today. Why does it matter so much? All right. So first of all, this is merely an opinion, which is that I'm convinced that it'll help drive your business. There are various studies that show with varying degrees of strength that empathy increases shareholder return in spades. Mm Mm-hmm. The challenge with those studies, and to be real, is that the, it's very difficult to measure empathy and to isolate the specific skill of empathy as the 
the real reason why my share price might be going up. So mm -hmm. that's to be real with the story because I'm a businessman after all, and I don't think it's about being idealistic. The key point here for me is that empathy doesn't need to be applied everywhere, all the time with everybody. What you need to do as a business is to think about strategically what's important for you. Where, is, where are your some strategic gaps? And this is really relevant when you're sort of a mid-tier manager, so that when you want to bring in the idea of empathy, maybe hire a coach to help your team be more empathic. If you can link it into what the CEO has dictated as the strategic imperatives of the next year or two, mm -hmm. then it's an easier sell. This is what we're doing is we're hiring a coach that's going to help satisfy this need, which might be higher productivity, which might be more innovation, which might be greater motivation. Whatever that, that issue is, has been identified at a corporate level. You want to participate in that. And if you can lean in on empathy in that specific area, that will help you to focus on when you need to really listen. It'll give you a reason why everybody should want to improve this skill. And the last thing I'm going to say is that one shouldn't just think of empathy as a skill towards the outside. The real juice happens when you, you have congruency within your organization mm -hmm. and the way you are dealing with your customers. Don't expect your salespeople to treat your customers with golden gloves if you don't do the same with them. Right. So, so the interesting one, I want to come back to that with, I made a note on Amazon. So you always hear, um, but, 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 but just back to the, the coaching on empathy. So not all roads in this podcast lead to sales. We talk about so many broad topics, but, but I will say this idea of, of having empathy for the buyer today is so critically important, having that skill of empathy where we understand what they're going through, because what we're seeing folks, the, the, the direct causal connection here is the percentage of deals that go to no decision right now is skyrocketing. So somebody investigates something, they uh, multiple different vendors pull in resources to fulfill an RFP or some review. And at the end of the day, what's happening, the buyer is doing nothing. You know, somewhere between 40 and 60% of the time, they just go, I'd rather miss out than mess up. And one of the things I think we're having a difficult time is truly putting ourselves in the shoes of the buyer and then understanding this. I'd rather miss out than mess up. After they've decided they've found an opportunity and we've earned that right to kind of have a positive business case, they then literally just get cold feet. Hey, Eve, if I move forward with this, I'm really putting my neck on the line. There may be some benefit to my company, but I'm really concerned that if it fails, I'm going to look terrible and I could lose my job. There's this real switch. And a guy named Matt Dixon, who wrote The Challenger Sale, articulates this in his new book called The Jolt Effect. But, but there's this switch. We really have to stay close to our buyers and understanding what stage are they at and where, and be empathetic, understand what they're going through. And that's a real risk, by the way. If you sell anything material, enterprise software, software of any time, uh, type, the chances the project tanks are surprisingly high and the stakes are pretty high. So, so it's, it's frankly, it's just good business as a seller. If we can understand our client, their business, the environment, the trends in their industries, the pressures they're under, how that changed it's month to month or, or, or quarter to quarter, we're the more we understand them, and then can truly understand how to try and get them to a better future somehow, professionally, maybe even personally, the better our chances of being successful. So this skill of empathy is so critical. Yeah, or this two things, two things to respond on that. And uh, one is to reference a friend of mine, Guillermo Di Bisotto, who talked about the fact that a buyer is also a salesman. Because yes. the buyer needs to then sell this project, this whole yeah. thing. And and, and that's really an interesting perspective to take as you're selling into. If you can recognize how you can help this person, uh, not necessarily assuage their fears, because that's going to be hard to do, but at least give them all the, the knowledge, the tools, uh, the, the information classed in a way that satisfies their company strategy. And the second piece, Mark, is, is around 
really the, the upscale or the up funnel piece, which is trust. So empathy is a maybe a conduit to trust, but really what you need to have is trust upstream because that's going to allow you to have the data to understand the situation for this person. So they might tell you, well, we don't need any business or we, I like this product, but it's not for me. What is it that's not for me? Ex having them explain the, the objections, if you will, or lay out what their personal fears are, or mm -hmm. maybe look under the hood of actually how the business is going. What can they or can't they afford and yes. what's happening within getting that information is gold in order to get it. You need to have their trust. You do. You need to have their trust and you have to have credibility in their eyes. And you're, you're earning that this whole way along. And, and frankly, you, you know, your number one point on developing the muscle, a lot of that comes from actively, actively listening after being able to ask great questions where you're proving to them, you actually already know a little bit about their world. You know, when we're having this discussion, we have context here. I don't know you specifically, but I know 50 people who run businesses exactly like you. This is what they've been, you know, experiencing. Suddenly you're going to go, well, this, the buyer goes, well, I think this person gets it. They actually understand my issues, my challenges, my opportunities, and, and you're earning the right to get them to open up and to build that relationship. So, so let's go back to the importance before we get outside of the business, Minter, you, you spend a great deal of time about the first four or five chapters on inside the business. And, and I really appreciate the fact it's hard to measure how empathetic a company is, but there, there just feels like, of course, you know, you'd be increasing employee engagement, you'd be, you know, reducing churn, uh, unwanted churn, if you've got an empathetic organization. And I have this really interesting experience right now because I often deal with CEOs who are not empathetic. And, and you know, lots of good and logical reasons that a technology CEO in a mid-sized firm is just insanely driven and not highly empathetic. But, but I've had this really unique experience with a, a client recently where the CEO is very, very empathetic. So anything we're doing from a consulting perspective, they're very cautious of how is this going to be perceived by the sales team? What are they going through? These are the kinds of things, the fears they have, all of these kinds of things. It's, it's really interesting. So I think there's this balance. But, but um, we had Tiffany Bova. You might know Tiffany Bova from yes. Salesforce. And her recent Definitely. book it, is called The Experience Mindset. When she was on the show a month ago, let's say. And there were two stats, um, Minter, that just blew me away. I should know this, maybe you do, but her research had proven that about 17, or she pulled from research that said 17% of employees today are actively disengaged. So 33% are engaged, a whole bunch are kind of disengaged, but 17% are actively disengaged. And so I said, what's the definition of that? They actively want their company to fail. So they'll do things in sabotage, which blows your mind because you go, well, you're working for the company. Don't you know you're going to be impacted? They don't make the connection. They just want bad things to happen to the, the company, 17%. Then she pulled a stat that'll just make both of us fall off our chair. The cost to businesses of actively disengaged employees globally seven trillion dollars annually <laughs> seven trillion dollars annually so so um huge issue obviously just massive problem even if we could do anything with a quarter of a percent it feels like to me that um the environments i've been most comfortable i think i'm reasonably empathetic I think I relate better to leaders who are still tough, but empathetic. Any stats or comments there for the folks listening? Because I think what we try and figure out is outside of exterior, outside the business. I think a lot of the CEOs who might be listening to this, they're really going, why would I do this? And, and, and you, you bring up a good stat in some of the research you did that said 
77% of CEOs feel that if they're too empathetic, they'll be seen as weak or ineffective. I forget the exact quote. It is that 77% like that. Uh, fear that they will lose respect if they are more or too right. empathic. Well, that is a, uh, a a good starting point for for commenting because in the end of the day, it it reflects on the one hand a misunderstanding of what empathy is, mm. and two, it spells out something that I have seen in other statistics, which is that uh, CEOs that are successful tend to struggle to change because they are successful, and that's how they got where they are. Right, and there, if you are successful and wealthy. Uh, tall and male, uh, there are other studies that have shown that those are also other things that hurt you in your empathy development. So this, this is a misunderstanding. And, and uh, so what the key point here is to at least think that being empathic can also be a tremendous driver of the business when applied and done with authenticity. There are two other things that need to be uh, made aware of in terms of reasons why we still suffer from a lack of empathy in business. And you talk about the lack of motivation of everybody. There are a lot of things that go into that, but there are two things that specifically are troublesome with regard to the development of empathy in a business and a culture. And the first is a lack of time. I, hmm. I don't, I, the number of times that I go and see or talk to a CEO and their agenda is 100 booked up, 100% booked up. That's absolutely posse. Uh, to give you a specific antidote to that, what I did when I was CEO is that I had 50% of my day barred off free. And that was work that I would do with my assistant in order for me to make sure that I had the time. And it might be to go listen to a client, walk down the aisle, listen to an upset or some challenge that a, an employee has, my team. And, and so uh, by, by having the time, then you are enabling the ability to do it. If you don't have the time, you're never going to really develop it. And the second thing, and this is also very relevant in the context economically, like you're saying, the long decision times or the no decision times, mm -hmm. is that we are in very sketchy economic situation here. And when we are stressed for business, stressed for performance, stressed for our career, are we going to get fired? All this, the stress level uh, will not be a, a good factor for developing empathy. Right. Well, well you bring up um, the, the detail and you reference you being a CEO. That was when you were CEO of L'Oreal. Uh, Red and, and a lot of- At Red Canoe. Yeah. And Red Canoe. And a lot of that, by the way, folks documented, um, really uh, discussed and you lead how being yourself makes you a better leader. And I'd really encourage you, you'll see the link here, but um, we have a great podcast with Minter from maybe a year ago where we discussed it. I really enjoyed that one. I've gone back and listened to that one a couple of times. Uh, that's you. where we learned that Minter was a deadhead, by the way. That was the original uh, clue that Minter was a deadhead. And, and you know, so so we, we think we understand what empathy is. We understand, you know, thinking about it for our business. We absolutely know why it's important you know, to treat our clients and prospects with empathy uh, to improve that customer experience. The case is made that unless we have an organization that's empathetic, it's very difficult to actually, you know, have your brand be empathetic or your customer experience, uh, the empathy from us, have a great customer experience. But a good half of the book is dedicated to artificial intelligence and empathy and artificial intelligence. And you were one of 500 people that participated in the empathetic future experience. Tell us a little bit about that one. Well, that was a, a gorgeous opportunity. It's a organization based out of Germany, in Berlin, that was wanting to see how human beings would interact with an AI that was empathic. So they, they went about creating a, a path over um, five days where you were 24 seven in touch with an empathic bot. And the, the, the notion was to sort of ev evaluate the emotional frequency resonancy of each of these 500 people, uh, uh, about one third of whom were German, the other was were English speaking. And then there was a, a larger proportion of men than there was women, um, but 
I, I, I did get a chance to talk to the team afterwards. In any event, the, the thing was this, living the experience. What's it like? How does it make you feel? What does it make you think when you are mm. talking to a bot that appears to really understand me? Mm. And by gum, that was the feeling that I got. Uh, and by the third day, I had generated uh, an attachment to this bot. It became wow. a figure in my mind. And, and it, it struck me about how, how much we are thirsting for someone to listen to you. Oh. Uh, in this case, it was me wanting to be listened to. And the bot had endless time, was totally there for me, is the way I felt it. And um, it, it was a, a wake up call to think that actually it's not so difficult to start to have feelings for a bot. Just like in the very first rendition of Eliza back in the 60s, where they had the AI, you know, very primitive AI, all the engineers mm -hmm. uh, completely fell in love with, or at least put another way, were deeply engaged with Eliza for many hours, wow. despite them having lots of other things to do. And only because the bot had a Rogerian type of the Eliza had a Rogerian style of answer that made you just made you just continue to dig into your what you're thinking. Why do you feel that? How's that important to you? And so on. Next thing you know, you're just spewing out your guts. Alexa and Siri. You know, yeah, very, very human engaging voices, in some cases. And and so you know, you sort of get used to speaking to somebody. And maybe even, you know, you forget you know what what's taking place how far along and and you make some great references to where chat gpt is and and all of those things um but but really this is so relevant folks because all of us you know have bots on our website and many of us are migrating leveraging ai uh, for some data analytics or for responding to basic inbound customer queries you know, where are we today with with those technologies showcasing empathy? And how much did you like, you know, the dead song that Chat GPT wrote for you when you asked Chat GPT to write a song? I think that was unbelievable too. Yeah. So um but right now we're at a stage where empathic AI does not exist. Where the real stage we're at is, huh, how can we identify empathy? within certain actions, words expressed by machines. And, and which essentially means that we, we certainly can't go deep and we can't go wide either mm -hmm. uh, because we, we haven't developed the sophistication to have a long string of conversations where empathy is being in, 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 imbued. There's a, a couple of really important points. First is that Another way of looking at empathy is thinking about it as the emitter and the receiver. Okay. So let's say you and I are having a conversation and I am trying to be empathic with you. I am trying to emit empathy in understanding what you're saying and formulating back, observing your emotions. And then you are the receiver and, and you are may or may not be receiving and feeling that there's empathy on the other side. Typically, we measure empathy from the feeling side, the receiver side. Okay. In the case of business in, in particular, but in many cases, empathy may not be so obvious. Empathy may not be observable. And, and therefore, you won't be getting any receiver bonus points. But as, as you look at the emission of empathy, there are many ways that machines could help people to, to render more empathic their messaging. So hmm. in the emission version, so it doesn't mean that when Mark receives my email, he's going to say, oh God, Mint is so empathic. Mm -hmm. But he might open it, he might click on it, because underneath that is empathy. But if you went back and said, how empathic do you think Minter was, Mark? Again, back to the measurement thing. And, and there, the last piece is that when you are looking at embedding AI and even more empathic AI into your business. The key thing is to think about where you are already. What level of honesty do you have about the empathy in your culture? Because you're mm -hmm. not going to try to delegate 
to your AI a kind of behavior that doesn't reflect who you are internally. Right. In other words, you be really empathic, Mr. AI, because we within, we don't care about that. We don't think it's important. Huh. So the, this uh, notion of honesty with regard to where you are in the culture and the ambition really should only be to be more empathic than that, which brings up the idea of how do you measure it before and then that right. there in the future. But yeah. that, 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 having that discussion about how you want to measure where you are today as a culture is the victory because rarely is this topic ever discussed in boardrooms. Mm. But, and, and so, you know, maybe tactically speaking, oftentimes when I'm talking with teams who are developing AI or, and I talk about going in with the, the empathy with it, well, what do you, what is empathy? And, and, and for you, how do you categorize that? Because what you're going to have to do ultimately with your large learning model and your data set is, is to be able to tag and rank, if you will, what type of phrases do you believe in your culture, in your organization, with your clients, for example, or your employees, is empathic? Mm. And, and that ability to, to tag within your data set, your personalized data set that would say reflect all of your emails, all of your websites, you know, all oh. the things that you as a company have been doing and, and interacting with as a way to understand what is actually your particular culture and your version of empathy. Yeah, I keep folks, I keep nodding and and frankly the wheels, my slow wheels, but the wheels are just churning internally so much. You know, there are these fundamental messages that come across. We all want to feel like we're understood. Actually, we and in the funnel are no different than anybody else. I want somebody to land on our website and within milliseconds or seconds, they go, these guys actually get it. They understand what I'm going through. We have coaches and partners. One of them is called Strategic Coach. And they co they're the largest entrepreneurial coaching program in the world. And about 25,000 of the you know, most successful entrepreneurs have been through their program. Every time I go to a quarterly workshop, I'm sitting there going, they, they know nothing about sales training. They know nothing about my consulting business. Sitting beside me is somebody in, in a manufacturing business, two, door, two seats over a SaaS CEO. We all sit there and go, these people understand the life experience of an entrepreneur. They know what we're going through. And suddenly there's this exactly what you've talked about, this trust and immediate connection. And you're right. That is what's going to get somebody to click through or to, you, you know, uh, engage with you or open. You're making it about them and you understand them. There's nothing, if I could, Mark, there's nothing like the experience. If you've had the experience being an entrepreneur, it's not yeah. very difficult to imagine what it's like to be an entrepreneur at that level. And, and so you are finding shared experiences. And that yes. is a, a beautiful way to connect with people. I, when, we, when I was running Redken, well, actually in all my life at the professional hairdressing division of L'Oreal, there's, a, there's a, an incredibly important piece within the mix, which is education. These are and the best versions of them who are training hairdressers how to use the products are from hairdressers. So hairdressers mm -hmm. teaching hairdressers makes so much more sense. And the interesting thing is not the, the, the credibility goes up to the extent that they're not employees. Yes. When they individually contract with you to be independent contractors as hairdressers to talk in your name, then it's, it is literally the best word of mouth that you can create. Testimonials. Yeah. Right. You, you, you know, it's the same thing as a testimonial. Well, somebody says, I, I'm, I'm likely one of the best salespeople for a strategic coach with due humility to my, all my, the team at strategic coach who's listening today, but when they'll have me speak to some people considering the program, they'll just say, talk to Mark, see what, I, see what he went, went through. And of course I'm unbiased. I'm a third party. I, I have no, you don't I, have to say what you're saying. I don't have to say what I'm saying. So, so the person on the other end of the Zoom call knows my intent is only to tell the truth. So, so, and I'll tell the truth. And by the way, I'm validating the truth with my own checkbook because, you know, or with, with my own money, because I'm a member of it. So um, excellent. Um, 
just just while I'm on, before I lose it, you said your next book is, is about conversations. And so if you're comfortable, if without you totally. know, um, hurting the, the rollout or anything. Tell us a little bit about that book, Minter. What, what, what's, uh, what the, what's the book about and where are you with it? So it, it absolutely comes on the heels of the book about empathy and leadership, because in the end of the day, what I've observed is societally, we are in deep doo-doo. The ability for us to have free, easy, and strenuous debate where we can disagree and learn to disagree and learn to be civil in that manner, uh, the ability to listen and so on is deeply failing. And so from a societal standpoint, from a personal standpoint, and from a business standpoint, while I largely talked about empathy in the same way, I think we need to relearn how to have stimulating conversations. And that Mm. means freedom to use words that we feel are appropriate and not be uh, so worried about um, the speech that we're using. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be attentive it just means we need to come back a little bit to reality. So my new book, uh, I can talk about it all the more, Mark, because I did something really crazy. I set myself the task of writing it in the manner of a Charles Dickens. So for oh, holy seven smokes. T- yeah, <laughs> for my punishment, watch this. So <laughs> 79 weeks on Thursday at 5 p.m., I published a chapter. And, you know, so between one and 10,000 words. And uh, so I have a corpus of 400,000 words uh, through, through those 79 weeks. And I'm now in the process and I publish them and I would have conversations around conversations online, offline. And that participated in the wo- wiggly woggly room uh, as I moved down my 79 weeks. And, and so I'm sorry, explain to me, Minter, I don't, is that how Charles Dickens wrote his books? He actually published a chapter at a time? Right. So these, this is called serial publishing, and it was okay. uh, made popular uh, at the end of the 18th century and during the beginning of the 19th century in many countries. Charles Dickens is the one who's most uh, credited for it, but it mm-hmm. happened before he started writing. It happened in America. It, it was actually a cheaper way to publish a book, if you will, and okay. to test it out. And, and so what they would do typically in those days is that they would publish it as a chapter in a magazine, in newspaper. And that was oh. a weekly newspaper. And so it became the serial chapterization and people would read it week after week and, and really stick with it. And Dickens is most well known for doing that. He, I don't think he wrote every book like that, but he wrote many books like that. I think I get smarter every time we have a, you on, on the podcast. So I, there's a number of people on my team that would have encouraged me to be speaking to you every two weeks. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Blush. So, so uh, awesome. And so where did you publish your 79 chapters and 400,000 words? Is this on your website? Is this on a, um, a blog somewhere? So I, in my inevitable fashion, just like when I started podcasting in 2010, blogging in 2006, I wanted to use a new platform. Uh, it's called Substack. If you haven't come across it, it's a place where they encourage freer speech. And, hmm. uh, and it also has a tremendous, it's really a, a writer's platform. It helps you to uh, create subscribers, paying or free. It, it, uh, so I ended up with something like 700 subscribers and about a tenth of them were paying subscribers. So it gave me a little bit of a stipend for writing. I'll call it in advance. By the way, I think after this publishes, maybe we should be targeting more than a thousand subscribers on that once this goes live. Thank you. Um, folks, everything, um, a couple of things we've identified there, those will obviously be in the show links. Minter, how else can our listeners today connect in with you and learn more about what you're doing? Well, um, I, I try to provide, one of my mantras is to provide valuable content every day. And I do it in very different manners. So that I would consider my podcast is a one-way Minter Dialogue. It's in English and in French, pour les francophones. It's, um, I have the joy of paddle, a new podcast that talks about the joy of playing my sport paddle tennis. Um, and that all is on my main portal site, minterdial.com. So you can find my books, my film, my documentary film and, um, and, and anything. And also I'm sort of out there on social. I don't, for, for one particular thing I'd like to say is I don't accept people just randomly, uh, connecting with me on LinkedIn. I, 
and I think it's important to spell out the reason, which is I'm not interested in a large number because uh, if, if my connections don't reply to me, I don't know them. I don't know them and I don't trust them. Then mm -hmm. it's not that I, you should take it personally, but I, I just don't accept because uh, it, it, it doesn't serve a real network. But what, by the way, all those links, folks, will be in the show notes for today. And, and um, everybody should be reading Artificial Empathy, Putting Heart into Business and Artificial Intelligence. And by the way, everybody should check out You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes a Better Leader, um, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. Um, I enjoyed both of these books enormously. This is one of the true joys of doing this podcast. It actually forces me to read the books of the guests. And so we therefore only gen pick guests that we actually want to talk to. So, so nice. um, Minter, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today. It's always such a pleasure speaking with you. My delicious delight. Thank you very much, Mark, for having me on and, and promoting my work and, uh, and the friendship that we're developing. You bet. And team, thank you for listening today. You know, the reason we run the In the Funnel or the Selling Well podcast is we, we want to improve the performance and professionalism of B2B sales. So it elevates to the profession it truly is. And in doing so, we believe we're improving the lives of professional salespeople or anyone in sales. So we run this podcast to help, to give you tools, processes, topics, best practices, ideas that you can apply immediately. We know we can get better at this. So, so, and you're such a great source at this. So if there's something we can be doing to make, it, to make the Selling Well podcast even more effective to you, please let us know. And you can reach out to me personally at Mark Cox at inthefunnel.com. Mark Cox at inthefunnel.com. I check that, that email personally, and we respond to everybody who gives us a nice piece of constructive criticism, and we love constructive criticism. So thank you for the feedback you've already get, given us. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast. That, that means a lot to us as well. That helps us get great guests like Minter, and we'll see you next time on the Selling Well podcast.